down in the den. So go tell a friend. The best podcast on earth is about to begin. We got jokes and news and movie reviews. After Dark NC-17 with the crew. Interviews with the best artists around. So like, comment, subscribe. The show's starting right now. Let's go. Like, comment, subscribe. The show's starting right now. Welcome to Down in the Den. It's your boy, Mars, and welcome to the Den. My special guest joining me tonight is a podcaster himself, host of the Raver Circle podcast. My guy, AJ Hollywood Hyde. AJ, welcome to the Den. How you doing today, brother? How's it going, everybody? Um, yeah, It's going well, man. I can't complain. Another week just out here working, grinding, you know, doing the best I can to I'll just get heard out here so absolutely the grind never stops but i don't think we'd have it any other way man it's a journey right exactly it is a journey for sure i love it i love it well this brother man he is we are kindred spirits not only are we both podcasters we're both obviously fans of the the raving community and and plur lifestyle and everything like that but also besides being music fanatics and podcasters we also have something very, very uh, special in common, a link. We both are huge pro wrestling fans. And right now, it's probably been the busiest and hottest time in pro wrestling since the 90s, since the Attitude Area. So what we thought we'd do, if our powers combine, we combine our two forces, our knowledge, our podcasting abilities, our skills, to give you guys the, the best pro wrestling talk, chat, on the World Wide Web right now. So we're going to lay the smack down on some wrestling talk. And we always generally begin our shows with the same question, origin story, origin story on how you got into podcasts and how you got into music, whatever it may be. But in this episode, we're going to do it a little bit different. So AJ, tell me, what is your origin for your love of pro wrestling? And then I'll share mine. Oh, man. Where do I begin? I, I want to say my origin began in uh, 96. I think that was the year 96, 97. Um, that was when I got into pro wrestling. And for me, what like grabbed me into the world of wrestling and sports entertainment was the Attitude Era. You know, you alluded to it earlier, but man, that was just one of the the best times in pro wrestling. You had the Attitude Era and WCW, World Championship Wrestling, for, you know, our newer wrestling fans that aren't familiar with the 90s, you know, it was a competition. Like, you know, before, you know, the AEWs came along and before New Japan Pro Wrestling became big and before the impacts of the world, man, we had, you know, WCW, and at the time, WWF, this was before they transitioned to WWE. And, man, it was just such a great time. It was the competitive spirit between both companies, uh, the flawless and amazing matches that were put on. Um, you can look at Monday Night Nitro, and there's Eddie Guerrero going against Rey Mysterio. But then you can turn over to Monday Night Raw, and... You can have the likes of Triple H going one on one with The Rock. So, you know, you've had like the very best just going at it between both companies. And I think that competition and the storylines between the two organizations was like what pulled me in. So, I want to say 1997 was like the year where I was like, oh, this is, this got me. I'm locked in fully. So, that was a very, very good year. We're talking about the NWO first yes. format, and we're talking about the Generation X. We're talking about the Attitude Era, Stone Cold, Bret Hart. Yeah. Undertaker. That, Undertaker, of course, Dang. Triple H, you, you oh, name man. it. Mankind. Exactly. Uh, great times. Yeah, for me, it, it was, I kind of fell in and out of love of wrestling. Um, I remember when I was very young it was like the tail end of the hogan era probably 94 uh ultimate warrior was kind of popular but 
at that point, I felt they were a little cartoonish. I didn't really like what WWF was doing. You know, back then, every wrestler was a profession. You had the big boss man who was a cop. Oh, you had, uh, you know, the dumpster or, I mean, you name it. Whatever job you wanted, there was a wrestler that did, Isaac Yankum, DDS, you know, the oh. list goes on. So at that point, I kind of fell <clears throat> out of love of wrestling. And then a, a good friend, uh, my friend uh, King Petty, co-host of Down and Den After Dark, he put me on to some ECW tapes, like in 95. <clears throat> and I don't even know where he got these bootleg ECW tapes. It looked like they were filmed on the Etch-A-Sketch, but the quality was trash. But I was supposed to hardcore wrestling for the first time, and I was like, wow, this is crazy. And then right when ECW began to blossom, a lot of those wrestlers, the Eddie Guerrero's, the Rey Mysterio's, went on over to WCW. So I was like, oh, I saw him on ECW just a month ago because the tapes are always in delay. And now they're on WCW. So that's really what I started liking wrestling. Same time, like 96, 97, uh, Attitude Era. And then from there, DX. And <clears throat> even now during the ups and downs, I'm still always in the loop with what's going on, not only there, but I'm looking at GCW, I'm looking at Ring of Honor, I'm looking at New Japan Pro Wrestling, I'm looking at NWA Power, I'm looking at Impact, I'm looking at so many awesome sources of wrestling, and so that's why I said it's like the best time since probably the Attitude Era. Ratings may not be the same, uh, stories may not be as consistent, but overall there's so much quality wrestling out there, it's a great time. I agree. So what's your favorite promotion? You mentioned WCW. Uh, what's your favorite promotion of all time and what era? Ooh. Um, okay. I might be a little all over the place with this one. And this might sound politically correct, and I don't mean for it to sound politically co correct, but um, for me... WCW and WWE during the Attitude Era, like during the Monday Night Wars. And I say that because I can't speak for anyone else, but for myself, I kid you not. And like, I can't make this up. I literally fell in love with both promotion companies at the same time. Like literally, there were nights I remember in 97, 98, 99 even, there was nights where I would flip channels back and forth between Nitro and Raw because I loved certain wrestlers from both promotions. So from the WCW side, I loved Sting. Sting was one of my all-time favorites. Um, the Ric Flairs of the world. Uh, Booker T, of course, NWO. Um, the Rey Mysterios, the Eddie Guerreros, this was pre-WWE. So, um, but then the WWE side, which was WWF back then, um, during the Attitude Era, The Rock, uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin, The Undertaker, DX, Mankind. Um, and there was just so many interesting characters between both promotions and I think what gravitated me towards both WCW and WWF slash WWE is at that time, you got to see that you have two major companies battling. I'm talking like serious bad blood between both of these companies. It was not for the faint of heart. There was no love lost during that time period whatsoever. The war. Yeah. It was a Monday Night War. And the war. you had... Eric Bischoff constantly throwing jabs, throwing shots at WWE, even going as far as the Monday night where they predicted Mick Foley winning the WWE championship. I put um, butt in the seats. That 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 famous, infamous line, which was the turning point yeah, in the Monday Night War. I agree. And from DX invading Nitro, I, I'm sure you remember that as well. I was actually there. I was actually there. Uh, it happened in Norfolk, Virginia. Yeah, which Norfolk. Was, that's my neck of the woods. That, right. 
So, you know, VA is my neck of woods. I lived in Hampton. So we had one show going on the Hampton Coliseum. We had another show going on in Norfolk. I was at the WCW show. So I was wow. hoping that they would let the Generation X in the building, but obviously it didn't happen. But uh, yeah, that it was an incredible time. Incredible time. Oh, absolutely. But yeah, didn't mean to drag it out. Um, but yeah, during that time period. But currently, currently I have I would have to say New, New Japan Pro Wrestling. Like they put on some five star matches and like WWE, um, Impact, ROH, not even AEW. And AEW is phenomenal. You know, I just want to put cool. that out there. But New Japan, they're just doing the damn thing right now. So in New New Japan, as far as just bell to bell action, has been, in my opinion, the number one promotion probably for the last seven years. Uh, maybe longer from just bell to bell in the ring in ring action. For me, my favorite time, my favorite promotion of all time or time period era was probably WWF Attitude Era. My favorite wrestler of all time is Shawn Michaels. So uh, that I actually, when I got married, I, I came down to the aisle to Shawn Michaels theme music, did his whole <laughs> dance and gyrated in front of my, uh, you know, grandmother-in-law's face, which probably didn't go over well, but uh, it, it was, uh, that was my favorite wrestler. I thought I, I got in detention so many times for crotch chopping people and, and things of that nature, it's but that goats, was man. goats. And that was probably my best time. And then the rock, my girlfriend at the time in high school, uh, for probably a solid three months, I taught like the rock. I didn't even realize I was doing it. It was so influential. And so she was like, uh, what do you want to do for lunch? And I'm like, it doesn't matter what you want. And I'm like, oh my God, I can't <laughs> uh, Why did I talk to you like that? I, I don't know. So I was obsessed with the rock. So that was the best time. But equally, I agree with you, WCW, especially uh, before 2000, I would say 2000 is when they started to go downhill. But that run from probably 96 to 99, uh, mid-99, was a crazy run that you will probably never be duplicated again in pro wrestling. I agree. So what is your favorite match? And I'll start it off. For me, my favorite match, WrestleMania 25, I've mentioned before, HBK is my favorite wrestler. I think him and The Undertaker, you really got both of them towards the end of their career, but at the peak of their storytelling ability in the ring, their peak of uh, being able to just put together a crazy match. 26 was good too, but for me, WrestleMania 25, HBK, Undertaker, by far the best WrestleMania match, easily, and my favorite match of all time. How about you? Is there one particular match that stands out? Um... You actually said one of my I have a one I'll say a one A and one B. So one A okay. will be definitely Taker and Michaels, what WrestleMania 25. That's one A. But one B for me would be uh Michaels and Hart, WrestleMania 12. Mm, Iron Man match. The Iron Man match. Yeah. The childhood dream. Yeah. That that's I I I, I as an HBK fan, for me to say, I, I hate to forget about that one. But, yeah, that one was phenomenal. That one was the match that actually turned me to the biggest HBK fan because I wasn't a fan of his character and the gyrating and all of that stuff. I was like, that's kind of weird. But then when I would see him get in the ring, I'm like, oh, he's really getting his ass whooped. or He's really laying it. Like, he was one of those wrestlers, him and Bret Hart as well, uh, on the late on heart as well that really you know you're like oh are they fighting you couldn't tell like you knew with Hulk Hogan the the lead drops and the the ultimate warriors those giants from like the 80s and early 90s but the the Bret Hart's and the Shawn Michaels and the Owen Hart's and the things of that nature they really for me I was like oh man they are they're performing at such a high level that it, you forget that you're looking at theatrics it, it was just crazy to me So now, 
what is your I'm, I've already mentioned for me my favorite wrestler of all time is HBK who's your favorite male and favorite female wrestler of all time okay um male I gotta go with the rock okay go with the rock um because I I grew up on him that was my childhood um from his debut at Survivor Series to him being in the nation of domination to him joining the corporation and being the hill to um, him becoming a baby face, him becoming one of the biggest superstars of all time and then going off to elevate the WWE in a new light and, you know, doing, you know, the movie things in Hollywood, you know, I, I grew up with The Rock. Like, that's who I saw. Like, and so I would say The Rock for sure, for male. Um, for women, female, I would say... Hmm, man, if so, this is kind of tough. So you stumped me with this one. If I had to go off of pure in-ring ability, Alina. She she definitely gets glossed over, but her in ring skills were just like very underrated. Like, and she's a multi time women's champion. Um, but as far as like the total package, like overall, Trish Stratus. Okay, satisfaction. And Melina, you made a very valid point with Melina. I think it was the backstage antics that kind of hindered what she could have been. Um, she's still out there. I think she shows up at NWA from time to time, still out there performing at a very high level. But Belina is definitely an underrated. Uh, I always thought that it was ironic to me out of that Eminem, I always thought that Melina might have been uh, the biggest star out of that tag team. I always thought she had the the biggest star potential out of either of them. Uh, the the Rock, yeah, he he's my one A with HBK. HBK gets that slight, um, but for me, just because of the classic matches. But when it comes to a persona, you're right. The Rock, I've I've never seen a wrestler that every version, every evolution, it just gets better. And better uh, to the point where, as you mentioned, he's the biggest superstar in Hollywood, really playing just himself. I I don't think anyone would say The Rock has the the best range as a actor. He's a great personality, but he's just that cool that people will go to see a movie to see him essentially play himself in every single movie. And it's a blockbuster hit. Exactly. Exactly. I agree. Now, for me, for female wrestlers, I am, uh, there's a couple. I uh, love Sasha Banks. I love Bailey. Uh, I feel her heel work really kept the WWE afloat during the pandemic era. I think she was phenomenal, and it's a shame she didn't get her mania as a payoff for the year she had. She really uh, held the WWE's women's division on her back. Um, so those are two that I I really love. Trish was great. Lita, great. Charlotte, great. I like Britt Baker. So it's a ton, uh, in the women. But for me, overall, I I would say Sasha Banks because she's just so crisp in the ring. I love, she, she gives me like female Eddie Guerrero vibes. And he was one of my favorite in uh, bell to bell performers in the ring. So for me, I'll probably go Sasha Banks. Nice. That's a good choice. Man. And Sasha, I think when it's all said and done, I think Sasha Banks is going to go down as one of, if not arguably, the greatest women's wrestler of all time. Yeah, she just has to stay healthy. That That's the only thing that can hinder her, a lack of passion and uh, health. But other than those two obstacles, if they remain a non-factor, you're absolutely right. She could definitely end the. She's still young. She can end uh, with being one of the goats for sure. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So it's a, it's an exciting time right now. We we have 
2022, we have Royal Rumble season coming up. Forbidden Door seems to be, there's all type of speculation of what could be going on in Forbidden Door. Ring of Honor has announced they're coming back. Uh, I've heard rumors of Stone Cold, rumors of The Rock setting up a rivalry with Romy, uh, with Roman. Uh, Cody Rhodes is a free agent. It's a lot of crazy stuff. Mott's will be back Wednesday on AEW. What are you most excited for right now for the first part of the year uh, with so many things coming up? I'm excited to see the direction of AEW and see, hey, WWE has some competition as far as like a major promotion. Like we haven't seen anything like this since, like we've talked about earlier, the Monday Night Wars in the mid to late 90s. So uh, I think it's a great time for professional wrestling because you have so many different promotion companies now. Like, you have the New Japans of the world and the Ring of Honors, and, you know, they're all doing their thing in their own right. But I'm curious to see where AEW takes things. Um, I am excited for the return of Mox. Man, that that guy. he will be emotional. Himself. Yeah. His matches, like, will have you just, your jaw dropping. He has some crazy matches that he competes in, but... He leaves it out, you know, he leaves it all out on the line whenever he competes. So um, definitely excited about that. It's Royal Rumble season. How can you not be excited about the Royal Rumble? So for me, I definitely got to mention the Royal Rumble. Um, but this whole forbidden door talk about, you know, certain superstars possibly coming back, a lot of speculations, a lot of teases. Man, I'm kind of excited for the Royal Rumble simply because I'm curious to see how they're going to go about some of the surprise entrants. Now, who would you like to see? The 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 current talk, I don't know if you've heard the news, but um apparently it got out and AEW is very unhappy that it got out that Cody Rhodes is currently a free agent. He's current TNT champion working without any contract whatsoever with AEW, which means even though he has the title, he is free to show up at Impact, he could show up at Raw. He could now do I think he would go anywhere? I don't think so. But the fact that a EVP, that paperwork would not be dotted on the line, it's a little it's a little alarming. And we do know Cody Rhodes is a wrestling genius he is definitely one of the biggest cogs and the whole reason that AEW is this that would be a shot fired if wwe was somehow able to snag the current reigning tnt champion and face of AEW right from under their nose do you think vince would be some some that vicious to do something like that or do you think it's a work? Do you think it's something that they're trying to use to build to his new heel persona? I honestly think Vince is crazy enough to do it. I mean, if you look at history, you know, during the Monday Night Wars, like both Vince and Eric Bischoff alike were going toe to toe, going like pulling no stops to get what they want. And so if Vince really wants Cody, I think he will make him a very, very generous offer. And I say that confidently because um, not just Vince McMahon, but a lot of the elites within the WWE circle, they always have the saying, never say never. Even even the superstars that leave on bad terms. Like, I would have never thought I would have, I would have never thought in a million years I would have seen Bret Hart return to the WWE after the Montreal screw job. I, I thought like, yeah, I thought that was a lifetime, a lifetime of resentment. I thought that was something that would uh, never be mentioned between the two parties. So yeah, never say never. And you know, a lot of the like I mentioned, a lot of the elite in WWE say that. So um, 
I guess we'll see. Yeah, I, I'm curious. I even if it was a short term thing, just to make a rumble appearance, why not? It, even if you show up on the rumble on Sunday and show up on AEW Wednesday back, I think that could only help. AEW in the long run. So why not? I think Tony Khan is crazy enough to have faith in his guys. And ultimately, it could be something that's beneficial for both companies. So I, I'm totally for it. Why not? Exactly. Now, now, other forbidden door rumors, we've heard rumors of Moxley perhaps going into Rumble. I feel there's no chance in that. I, I think that environment is not healthy for someone that's healing currently um but that was a rumor uh who else would you like to see in the rumble that may potentially come back for one off or even maybe a, another return run we thought carlito might have that opportunity last year he ended up for one match mvp on the other hand he ended up for an appearance that's turned to multiple years back with the company who would you like to see make a comeback Uh, uh, in a perfect world if we're giving you the book we're saying all right aj you're booking the rumble who do you have coming back as a surprise and who do you have winning i'm kind of afraid to say the name that i have in mind only because oh, man it's freedom free your mind take the pill man. the green pill blue pill whatever uh let so us know has this has no shot of happening right now. And I'm only speaking for right now because this goes back to the whole never say never rhetoric. Um, CM Punk, man. Oh, CM Punk. In a yeah. perfect world, if they were on good terms and they were able to hash things out, mend fences, and, you know, do right by, you know, their past. I would love to see a CM Punk return. I felt like he just left on such a bad note, man. Like, the way they did him towards the end, you know, it just, I just, I, I felt like the way, you know, he went about his exit from WWE, man, it's just so sad because it's like, it's just a bunch of what ifs. It's a bunch of what ifs. And he left right before mania season like right. we don't know how his storyline was going to play out he was we don't booked know to he was gonna... face triple h that year and he didn't want the match obviously him and triple h are are not terms but the booking was he was supposed to go over triple h but he didn't want the match and that's understandable you know i think cm punk was at a crossroads in which he was just basically like these these aren't the matches that I want. Like you have me feuding with Kane right now. Like like if like what's the point of this? I know y'all trying to like plant seeds and set up, you know, him and Triple H, but he was just unhappy. He was burnt out as well. Like there was just a lot behind the scenes that led to his departure. He was emotionally burnt out physically burned out and you know he just felt like there was no payoff and he's like there's no payoff to this like why are y'all gonna keep putting me through this bs so um but i feel like if there was a return in the future for cm punk it's gonna get such a loud pop um it's definitely gonna be shock value um but we'll see i mean yeah if i had to pick in a perfect world Definitely see him punk. And never say never, you can't rule it out. Like I mentioned earlier with the whole Bret Hart situation, I never thought after the Montreal screw job he was ever gonna be stepping foot in the squirrel squared circle ever again. And so we'll see. Yeah, he had came back at a WrestleMania match. I mean, it wasn't much of a match, but the fact that he technically had one and a U.S. title reign on the books. People I forget know. that. He, he, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, shout out to Bret Hart. The, the best there is, the best there was, the best there ever will be shot out. Uh, for me, I would love just simply for the fact, the way that they left 
Um, I would love the thing, Ray Wyatt. Um, he has not signed with anyone. He's had his time. Vince has shed so much talent that he might realize that the cupboards are bare. The fact that we see Seth Rollins from Raw having a universal title match with the SmackDown superstar shows that either A, a unification is on the horizon, and that, we can talk about that on another episode, or they're just really going to burn out the stars they have left. So having a Bray Wyatt coming in at number 30, the lights go red and really just giving him creative control. And if you can't have um, the rock and Roman, give us the Bray Wyatt and, and Roman and let Bray Wyatt be the hero that really can take down Roman. I think that would be my dream booking never happened in a million years because Vince feels Bray is fat and he feels he's difficult and, Things of that nature is clearly not what Vince wants, not what Tony Khan, not Tony Khan, uh, Nick Khan wants. <clears throat> so it would never happen. But that would be my dream booking for me. Uh, of the actual realistic competitors, who do you think is coming out this year with the victory? Rumors are Big E, um, but who do you feel uh, will be coming out this year? I'm going to have to. If I think things are going to go the way I think they're going to go, I'm going to have to say Big E. Um, outside of Big E, if I had to give like someone that uh, will have a runner's chance, I don't know. It's It's tough because I feel like as years have gone by with the Rumble, Usually, you'll kind of know, like, instantly, like, oh, they're going to be the winner. Like, you can kind of see the setup. But in recent years, that, that hasn't been the case. Like, even when Drew McIntyre won it, like, yeah, we kind of knew, like, it was teased that they were going to give him the big push. But there was also, like, in the back of your mind, like, hmm, maybe they might throw us a curveball. But, I mean, I think Big E has the best chance of winning it in my opinion. Um, outside of that, I don't know. It's kind of hard to gauge. It, it really is. It depends on like how things are going to be set up with certain superstars. Like to go back, and I just want to touch on this just for a quick, a quick second. You mentioned um, like The Rock. I mean, he's been teasing he might not be able to make it for Mania because of his movie schedule. Um, same with John Cena. I read a report last week that Cena probably won't be available for Mania season because of his uh, schedule with, you know, film obligations and whatnot. Right. So I'm thinking if we're not going to get superstars like that, some of the legends returning, um, who knows? But I got Big E winning it. I got Big E winning it. I could definitely see Big E pulling it out. My question is, what do we do here with the – it seemed like we were going to be heading for a, a Roman versus Brock at Mania. That's the way that it appeared. It also seemed that Seth Rollins was apparently rumored to have been booked to be the winner of the Fatal 4-Way that ended up becoming a Fatal 5-Way. Yeah. Could we see maybe a Paul Heyman or maybe a Brock interfering, having Seth go over Roman, and then that leaves Roman to pursue Brock on Raw. Is that a possibility? And then we end up getting Big E winning the Royal Rumble and going over to SmackDown with the rest of the New Day to head on over and face Seth. I think that's definitely a distinct possibility. Exactly. And we have a Big E Seth for the Universal title. And then you end up getting Roman over and maybe the Usos over on Raw to face uh, Brock. And now you can have... Uh, him be the man over on Raw for the next year since he's been the man over on SmackDown for the last year or some change. So I definitely could see that as a possibility. Uh, I have Big E as well, and that's how I would book it. But really, I want to see a heel turn. I want to see a Big E New Day heel turn with them maybe even interfering 
uh, to help Roman and help beat Brock because think about it, that's a built-in story. Brock has single-handedly randomly ended the reigns of two of the New Day's WWE members. If Brock's going to be a face now, you can make Big E and the New Day one of the biggest heel factions in a long time. And I think they would still move merchandise, maybe not for the kid, but uh, they, they have a much cooler factor than they're allowed to present if they were allowed to give a little edge. I, that's what I would like to see. Yeah, like literally everything you just said, I was going to echo. So hey, you said it for me. I, I totally agree a thousand percent um, with your take on that. So um, I think they should do the same thing. I, 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 I My only question is, okay, what do you do post-Rumble? Like what's going to happen with Lashley? You know, what's going to happen with him? What's going to happen with uh, AJ Styles? They're talking about AJ Styles is going to not not necessarily a title run, but AJ Styles is going to get somewhat of a push post Rumble. So uh, could AJ Styles be a dark horse winner in the Royal Rumble? I don't know. I'm not going to bank on it, but there's been rumblings about AJ Styles possibly getting um, a good uh, booking for WrestleMania. It's not going to be a title match, but I'm trying to think of who he would face. Like, who who would be a good pairing with AJ Styles at Mania? So, I'm thinking I'm him, booking, Lashley. It's, yeah, it's, it's a If I'm up. booking AJ Styles, I'm give, if, if, if you're giving me a match at Mania, I'm going to need Edge and AJ Styles. Oh, there we go. There I, we go. I think after Edge finishes this abysmal story with The Miz, his only Mania match should be lining up for AJ Styles versus Edge. Absolutely. I agree. That's I totally money. Agree. Those are two icons that have never faced each other that you know for a fact love the business, put serious thought into their craft, and and just let them book it. Give Edge uh, his free range of promos when AJ has the right to speak from the heart. He does an amazing promo. Uh, yeah, that that's the match. I don't know the dynamics. I don't know who's heel. I don't know who's face. I don't know if either face because I feel like AJ has kind of made a face turn. So, uh, yeah, either one. We could have heel Edge or heel AJ. Either one, I'd take it. Same. I agree. So let's fantasy book Mania. Uh, we'll start with Mania as two nights, and it's usually and probably 10 matches maybe uh, overall, maybe five matches a night. So uh, who, who are you fantasy booking for Mania? You can start with your opening match and get to the main event. For this year's Mania or just this, like? This year's Mania. Okay. This year's Mania. Um... Let's see. Let me start with the women. I want to see. I want to, man, they got to run it back, but I got to, I, I, I need Bianca and Becky to run it back because I don't like how they did Bianca when, and I get it for storyline purposes to, they needed to do the Becky Hill turn and, you know, build her back up post injury, having her come back last year. Um, but I, I got to see Becky and Bianca run it back because I think if they were to have a longer match and actually go toe for toe, I think it will be a phenomenal match. I think it will be a lot better than people will think. Um, so I know there might be a little like, if, no pun intended, Styles clash, <laughs> but. Um, I think um, they will surprise a lot of people. So um, Bianca and Becky Lynch, and not necessarily that be the opening match. Um, you can throw that second. You can throw that fourth on the card. Um, but, yeah, I would definitely have Becky and uh, Bianca for the women's title, um, for one of the women's title matches. Um, I would have... Yeah, we just talked about it. Styles and Edge, that would be 
a really good match. Um, I think that's a great opener match because they always say if you can't have the main event, you want to open the show. And I and I feel those two open in the night and just give them 20, 30 minutes to just open the night and get the crowd frothing at the mouth. I think that's how you do it. I think that's how I would open it uh, and book it. You probably have a Becky Lynch. You probably have her main event, one of the nights. The fact that they have two nights now allows them to have a female main event and a male main event. So I would probably have a Becky on as a main event of night one. I think that's that would make perfect sense. I hate manias where they don't have all the belts on the line. I feel stories should always focus around the belts and and you know you have the title, US title, absolutely. That that's that's one thing I really love about AEW, the ranking system and the way they make it more sports based. I've never really understood the rhyme or reason why someone gets a title shot in WWE. You'll have a Goldberg come back and be like, you're next, I get a title shot. And I'm like, what kind of sense does that make? This guy's been sitting on the couch for eight months and he just comes in and gets multiple title shots. It's weird to me. Yeah. Um, You got to put, I I wish Vince loved the tag team because the tag team division is suffering right now. You look at what's going on over at AEW and they have, literally the best tag teams on the planet so many good tag teams that lucha brothers can get hurt young bucks can get hurt and it doesn't even matter that that's happened so um i wish they gave more love to the tag team division i don't even know if the tag team belts would be defended at mania um honestly yeah and i you know as much as I love Usos and New Day respectively, they put on some classic tag team matches sure. in recent memory. I don't know if I want to see another Usos versus uh, New Day. Like I don't, I don't know if I want to see Usos against Kofi and and Xavier Woods at, at Mania. Like I don't know if it'll be overdone, but I don't know. I don't know how the. You know what? You you pose a really good point. Like. What is the tag team title picture going to look like come Mania? Or if they're even going to have the belts defended at Mania, they might have the belts defended on maybe the pre-show. Right. So they, they'll know. probably put all the tag teams, like they'll do a six-team rumble for the tag team belts or something like that, which is just a shame because you still have some intriguing um Tag teams, me personally, if they're giving me, they're making me the Booker Man for Mania, I would build the whole Mania up to the unification of all these titles. Um, I feel one of the biggest reasons they need to do that, with them losing over 80 wrestlers, some arguably main eventers, your Braun Strowman's, your um, Samoa your, Joe's, Samoa Joe's, your Bray Wyatt's, your uh, Adam Cole, how how they missed the ball on that. The Keith Lee's, the sure. Killer Crosses. Oh, These are the people that should be headlining Mania this year, and now they're you know talking about Stone Cold coming back or or Undertaker coming back. They they really burn their bridges, but they still have enough talent. But what they have to do, you can still have your brand split, but the champ appears on both shows. So if Roman's the champ. He's on both shows and he can have competitors from both shows in the ranking if they decided to do so. That's what I would do. I would kind of restructure. And if you really want to do a storyline to bring some real life into reality, have a a team Triple H versus team uh, Vince for the soul of WWE. Like have Triple H come back and say, I had a major cardiac, almost lost my life. And the first thing you did while I'm in the hospital is destroy my baby and fire my mentor, William Regal, and my best friend, Road Dog, and overwork HBK. And you and Nick Khan are trying to destroy my my brand, so now I'm taking over. Have that, and and literally, even if Vince is still making the calls, Make it seem on TV that we're really giving you something fresh 
new, different Triple H's vision of WWE and built to unify the titles to rebrand instead of an NXT 2.0. We need a WWE 2.0 to get people excited again about the product. That'll never happen because I do believe they're setting up things to sell and putting things in a nice, neat package to sell in the next year or two. But that would be my fantasy if I was allowed to just book it. I would bring it as Team Triple H versus Team Vince. And they're battling for the soul of WWE and book mania about that of one side will prevail, one side will fall. Yeah. Wishful thinking. I Wish. Mean, I think it'll be a, a good idea, but, you know, it's a long shot. It's, it's definitely a long shot. I'm just curious. Man, it's like, I feel like WWE is at a point in time where they have to build new stars. They just, they have to. Like, they don't have a choice at this point. It, we're only going to get Brock, but for so long. We're only going to get Roman, but for so long. Cool. Um, Probably last contract for Kevin Owens. I don't exactly. I don't see him wrestling until he's 50, nor will Vince want to have him wrestling. So, I mean, this generation, uh, John Cena's, he may have two more manias in him. I see him doing mania in Hollywood, not this okay. year, but next year, and maybe that being his retirement match, and then maybe get a Hall of Fame induction. Uh, even, uh, even the AJ Styles of the world, AJ Styles yeah. made a uh, made a comment something about like uh, he did sign a, a contract last year, so he's still locked in with WWE for quite some time, but. I think this might be his last, like, legit contract with WWE. Yeah, he may show up for part-time appearances. Right, yeah, he might show up for Rumbles in the future as, sure. like, the, the secret, you know, um, secret entrant for, like, the lead on the legend side. And A big match that they call out where someone's like, I used to respect you, now you're washed up, and he comes right. back to beat some young whippersnapper. But, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I could definitely see that. So you're right. Uh, new star now of the new stars that we see you know in aw you see they have the brawn breakers you see you have uh i don't i love what mandy rose has been able to do in nsc and really rebranding herself but there's there's not a lot that I, i i like carmelo uh he's pretty decent but it's not a lot that i've really love and a lot of that has to do with the character work that wwe is forcing on these guys uh you know braun breaker is probably the worst name ever created but of all the young stars who do you think has the best shot of being the nets up and comer the nets roman next roman uh I feel like they're trying to set Braun Breaker up, but I fear once he hits the main roster, it's like, where is his potential going to go? I don't think we've seen. I, I, I feel like we need more from Braun Breaker as far as, like, you know, longevity. Uh, but I can kind of see them doing that. I just hope they don't do a Charlotte uh, flair on Braun Breaker. Like, Having it be known that his uh, his father was the, one of the Steiner brothers and this successful wrestler, like I'm all for you know them, you know letting it be known like hey this 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 was this person's father they've wrestled they're a legend in this um, industry but I don't I hope they don't go that angle and shove it down our throats like with Charlotte Flair it seemed like. When Charlotte made the main roster, like every other week, they made it known this is Ric Flair's daughter. And after a while, I got tired. But back to the question at hand. Um, I'll be honest with you. I don't really see a whole lot um, of new superstars that I feel like will take the mantle from Roman Reigns. I don't even know if I see like the next Seth Rollins or the next Big E, um, so on and so forth. So. It's, we're in weird times in WWE, and I say that because 
yeah, we know who the main eventers are, but like, where are your mid carders? It seems like the mid card scene in WWE right now is just kind of lost in the shuffle. Like, you know, it's 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 a lot of uncertainty, and I don't know. That's why like this talk about Mania season between Rumble um, to to Mania is is very interesting. Like, I'm I'm my curiosity is. How will the mid carters be booked at Mania? We kind of have our sights set on who the main eventers will be on both the men and women's side, but I'm curious, how are the mid carters going to be booked? That's my question. So um, as far as like, who do I see taking Roman's place as kind of like that top dog um, once he fades away in the future? Uh, I honestly, I mean, you have Carmelo Hayes. Um, Austin Theory has some potential, but I don't know if he has, like, the it factor. And I'm talking about someone that can, like, carry the company on his back. Do I see anyone currently that can carry the company on their back? Not necessarily. Not from the new batch. That's not to say that that's not going to change. Of course, like, you know, you never know. I mean, there's certain superstars. They're just one gimmick away. Or... They're just one partnering away from like the likes of a Paul Heyman, not Paul Heyman himself, but that type of manager that will elevate them to the next level. I think it's just a lot of variables that are in play right now. And we just kind of got to wait and see what happens. But I don't think there's a clear cut person at the moment. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I'm praying for longevity and good health for Roman because uh, they, they're going to need them. They're going to need them right now. The fact that they're still so dependent on Brock, oh. who I can't imagine what Vince is paying. I don't think Brock has made this many appearances back to back to back since his run in the 2002. So, um, yeah, it, uh, the fact that it's still dependent is very scary. And the fact that at this time, you used to, WWE used to be the melting pot for the best wrestlers. Vince may tweak a character or change the name, but usually in the past, the characters have built themselves up either on the independents or in other promotions. Vince doesn't really like that. He wants his own homegrown superstars that have built and molded in his image. So unfortunately, that means you lack diversity and you don't really get to see what some of these guys can do. And you go over to AEW and you see these guys who are castaways like a uh, Miro, for example, who's doing some of his best work right now. Oh, yeah. And he was just cast away. A Christian, for example, who I feel that he'll t- turn is coming, was one of the two people to beat Kenny Omega this year. Who would have thought that? Vince would have probably put him in a scenario where he's just getting RKO'd every week. Uh, even being able to find a guy like Mark Henry and give him a spot where when he says, and now it's the main event, the whole crowd is chanting. AEW does a really good job with their legends, with their young guys, with their established superstars. Uh, Where Vince, to me, he's looking at everybody like an action figure. What can I sell with this character? That's why you see a Rick Boots more than you see a Shinsuke. Because Shinsuke is about being in the ring, but Rick Booz, that's a character. A guitar playing buff Freddie Mercury is a character he can sell. So that's my biggest problem with WWE. It seems all commerce, and it's missing a lot of heart right now. It is. And, you know, going back to what I said, we know who our main main eventers are, but, um, yeah, it's the mid-card for sure that I feel like where is... Y'all are supposed to be the meat and potatoes. Like, I feel like the main event is the dessert. Like, this is what we're really waiting on. Like, this is the the, the sweet stuff. But I right. feel like we need to, I feel like WWE needs to get back to the meat and potatoes. Make those, you know, compelling mid-carb storylines. Because even in the, the Attitude Era, um, there was a lot of compelling storylines with, some of the mid car wrestlers, even going into the ruthless aggression era. Intercontinental belts 
matches were always epic. You go back to Shawn Michaels versus Bret Hart or uh, Razor Ramon versus HBK or yes. Rock versus Stone Cold for the Intercontinental title. I remember uh, get, Monday Night get, Raw, man. A Monday yeah. Night Raw episode of RVD and Christian. One of the best, yeah. one of the most underrated ladder matches I've ever seen in my life. RVD and Christian tore the house down. And this was on Monday Night Raw. This right. wasn't even a pay-per-view. And it was for the IC title. And I feel like, yeah, you know, we need to start having those matches again for the IC and inter, uh, the uh, United States title. And I think merging those belts would make it more credible because now there's five less belts to go around. Get rid of the jump belts. We don't need a 24-7 title. That was funny. We should have a one women's title, one women's tag title, one tag title, one world champion, one mid-card. And then you can literally, you, you automatically increase your mid-card. So instead of having... Uh, who's the U.S. champ right now? Damian Priest, the Intercontinental Champion right now, Shinsuke, as of recording. So now there's one belt to go between. You've doubled. You've literally doubled your competitors. You can put a Xavier Woods in that uh, boat. You can put a Cesaro. Guys that can really go that you can put compelling stories, a Sheamus, uh, things of that nature, and put them. Get you a nice strong ten, uh, top ten for the intercontinental title a nice strong top 10 for the world title and and yeah. really that could give you stories because you can literally pair it. You, your top five heels your top five faces you pair them up and you have stories for days but they, it i don't think they think that far in the future so many politics as well i know i you you, you said a name and let me let's capitalize on it right now let's talk about it you said a name who i feel like can kind of revitalize the mid card scene in WWE. Said his name, Xavier Woods. With him coming off of the King of the Ring win last year, I feel like WWE, like what better time than now? Like, do something with Xavier Woods if you're not going to have him and Kofi compete again for the tag titles. If you want to give them a rest and have them do their thing solo. Definitely, hey, give Xavier Woods the keys. Like, Kofi, he's already done it. He's won his WWE title. Big E, he's recently won his WWE title. Now, let's see what Xavier Woods can do. Why not? Y'all have done two out of the uh, three members of New Day. See what Xavier Woods can do. Even if y'all give him a run at the title and he doesn't capture it, you know, do something with the whole King of the Ring thing. You, you could turn him heel. Like, I feel I like thought that's where they were going something. with that, with the whole accent and kind of acting better. I thought that's where they were going with that. And they still may be, but unfortunately he got injured. But I agree. Yeah, I know. I feel like, though, Xavier Woods healthy. Let's see what he can cook up. I, I, I say they should let him cook for a bit. Just to, just to put some fillers out, fillers out there. It could not work, end up not working out, but it doesn't hurt. I think that guy's got such a smart mind for the business and such a love for the business. If they let him have creative control of it, or at least some say way on his character, or in any way he wants to get over heel or face, I would love to see a heel uh, Biggie, a heel as Avery Woods, a heel Kofi, just being annoying, cocky. Uh, guys that they, I know they could be inside and let Kofi fight for the world title, let Big E fight for the world title, and put Kofi running the mid-card and just keep him away from the tag team division for a while. They can always yeah. come back, but I agree with you wholeheartedly and let those guys just still work together, but work together for the powers of evil. I think you would end up turning them face again within a year because they would be so popular. But I think they would have fun and it would give you so many compelling storylines. Yeah, definitely. I, I definitely think they would. Absolutely. So, brother, it has been a blast having this wrestling chat with you. We're definitely going to do it again. Before we go, I want you to give us your prediction. Who comes out with the Royal Rumble for the Universal title? We know we have... Um, 
Roman versus Seth, who comes out with that. And then we know, have they announced for the WWE title who Brock will be facing? Bobby, right? Bobby, yep. Bobby. Who comes out for each of those matches? So, I think, I don't know if there's going to be any involvement, but somehow, some way, Seth is going to come over on Roman. He's going to come out on top, which is going to set up Roman versus Brock over on Raw. And in return, I think we're going to get Big E and Seth set up for Mania, only because they've kind of been teasing it. And if you think about it, they dueled it out for the NXT title back in the NXT days. So right. there's that revisionist history of, hey, they've duped it out before back in NXT. And they're some of the OGs of NXT. They're the first NXT champion and the second NXT champion. Exactly. So they can play off of that. So I think it's going to be a setup for Roman and Brock heading into Mania. And then Seth and Big E heading into Mania. and then. We'll start to see seeds planted post rumble, you know, going into like elimination chamber and fast lane. We're going to start to see seeds planted for some of these other matchups that aren't for the championship. But yeah, um, I got Seth over Roman and then I got Brock over Lashley. I don't know if it's going to be clean. I'm not going to say they're, they're going to be clean pins. I'm sure there's going to be some type of interference or shenanigans going on to ensure one person comes out on top but yeah Seth for the universal and then for the WWE I have a uh, Lesnar over Lashley gotcha I agree wholeheartedly I, I feel the setup is for that because if we remember Seth never got his one-on-one -on -one with Big E they were building the whole thing up and it ended up becoming a triple threat and a quadruple threat and a sing tuplet threat or whatever so I could still see that coming, uh, and I think that would be definitely interesting and uh, giving us the setup we need. And ultimately, I feel it will end with Paul Heyman betraying Brock and coming back with Roman and doing the, bringing the bloodline over there on Raw. That's my prediction, so I agree with you. So, brother, it's been a pleasure. We have to do this again. I had a blast talking with the mind. Uh, that is just as deep in wrestling, if not better. It's been a treat. Let the the friends of the den and the den mates know where they can find you, your social media details, and what's going on over on your podcast. Awesome, awesome. So I have a podcast titled The Raver Circle Podcast. You can check out this podcast every Thursday evening. The, the, the podcast is live streamed through YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Twitch. So you can catch us on any four of those platforms. We stream simultaneously through those four platforms. So again, YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, and Facebook. And uh, the live stream is at 7 p.m. Mountain Time. So um, the, 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 the podcast is based out of uh, Colorado. Um, and yeah, every Thursday night. So. Make sure you follow us. We're on all of the social media platforms, your Facebooks, Instagrams. We're on TikTok. Uh, definitely follow us. Our handle, our social media handle is the same across all platforms. So the Ravers Circle podcast is the same across all platforms. Perfect. Check them out. They have some amazing things going over on the scene. I've checked out the stream. It's super dope. You know when it gets the den mate stamp, I'm batting 1,000 when it comes to my recommendations. I only recommend the best. He's super dope. What they're doing over there is amazing for the scene. So please check them out. And uh, as always, guys, thank you so much for tuning in to the special episode. I love sharing this side. We're going to do more and more because uh, I always said I'm a big nerd and those are the things I love. And I know you guys love it too. So as always, as we end every episode, peace. Love, unity, respect, deuces. It's down in the den, so go tell a friend. The best podcast on earth is about to begin. We got jokes and news and movie reviews. After dark, NC-17 with the crew. Interviews with the best artists around. So like, comment, subscribe. The show's starting right now. Let's go. Like, comment, subscribe. The show's starting right now.